Coming up on Market to Market. Markets rally as unemployment zooms. Crisis legislation keeps rural America in the picture. The next generation learns the art of the hedge. Pretty good one to look at. And commodity market analysis with Dan Huber next. Now from other parts of the world. Pioneer Hybrid International is a proud sponsor of Market to Market. Tomorrow, for over 100 years, we've worked to help our customers be ready for tomorrow. Trust in tomorrow. Information is available from a Grinnell Mutual agent today. AccuSteel, offering fabric covered buildings specifically designed for the cattle industry since 2001. The next generation of cattle buildings. Information at AccuSteel.com. This is the Friday, March 27 edition of Market to Market, the weekly journal of rural America. Hello, I'm Paul Yeager. The effects of COVID-19 are being seen in rural America. Social distancing has found its way into everything from meeting at the elevator to making contact with your local FSA office. On Capitol Hill, a $2.2 trillion relief package was wound and has made its way through Congress as of Friday. Last week, groups like the NCBA and NFU pleaded with lawmakers to remember rural America. Their voices were heard. Peter Tubbs has more. The largest aid bill in U.S. history sailed through the Senate late Wednesday. The bill is passed. On a 96-0 vote as senators patched up differences. The CARES, or Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act, will distribute more than $2 trillion to nearly every person and business in America. Agriculture did receive some provisions in the plan. Depending on math, agricultural sectors covered by the Senate Agricultural Committee will see nearly $35 billion in assistance. Emergency resources will be made available to livestock producers, the Commodity Credit Corporation as part of implementing the 2018 Farm Bill, and keeping open USDA inspection services to maintain supply chains. More than $15 billion is tagged for SNAP funding to handle projected jumps in applications. Agriculture was deemed essential critical infrastructure workers in an order from Homeland Security. As most travel between the U.S. and Mexico was stopped, exceptions for farm labor were put in place, allowing guest workers into the country and America's Salad Bowl looked to turn produce in the fields to items on grocery store shelves. We're very fortunate as this COVID-19 uh, pandemic hit our industry, it happened to hit during a slightly slower time of year. Uh, it is re really in between our really busy pruning time when the vines and trees are in dormancy as we go through the spring and before we get to the harvest part for our early uh, tree crops. For producers like Joe Del Bosque, the main crop now is asparagus. He's been able to find enough labor for now. However, the outbreak has highlighted the need for immigration reform. During this COVID-19 um, pandemic, we have to have people in the field to harvest our crops. Uh, the food cannot stop moving to market, and people depend on us. And we depend on these people to, uh, to be here to, to plant and irrigate and grow our crops and harvest them also. So we're very concerned. We need to get something done with this immigration reform. But how far essential stretches is evolving. Corn Belt farmers will soon be in the field, but the industries surrounding the dirt are taking precautions. Some implement dealers are telling customers much needed parts will be left outside the store after farmers call ahead for an order. Co-ops are still open, but paperwork and interaction is limited to waves and hand signals in a few locations. Many operations have yet to take delivery on seed, but hope distribution will have limited disruptions. Deer & Company is still operating some production lines. This week, the Moline, Illinois-based manufacturing giant removed 2020 financial guidance or projections on expenses and revenues for the year. The company cited the COVID-19 outbreak as the reasoning in its correspondence with the Securities and Exchange Commission. Several renewable fuels plants are either slowing or, in some cases, stopping production. 
The Renewable Fuels Association said around a fifth of U.S. ethanol production capacity would likely go offline by the end of March. That equates to 3 billion gallons a year and includes almost three dozen plants in shutdown and 40 plants at reduced production. For Market to Market, I'm Peter Tubbs. Trading commodities, even in times less volatile than these, can be a daunting task. The terminology alone has stumped more than a few. Josh Bittner found one classroom where the next generation of students is tackling those terms and how to apply them in our cover story. Turning a profit through Mother Nature can be precarious, a fact of which America's farmers are acutely aware. Things like soil health and weather intersect with fluctuating input costs, trade disruptions, and an array of other variables, creating perpetual uncertainty. So as agricultural products move from the field to end users, financially offsetting such potential losses, or hedging, has become essential. And the University of Idaho's Agricultural Commodity Risk Management Program is giving the next generation of traders, managers, and merchandisers a leg up, securing operational viability while learning to maximize profits. The program is relatively new. It's built upon the shoulders of a program in the College of Business, and we complement that by focusing on agricultural commodities. Almost an unprecedented territory. Clinical assistant professor Norm Ruhoff says commodities are a fundamental component of the U.S. economy. And three sectors, potatoes, grains, and dairy, form the core of Idaho's contribution. And by harnessing basis, the difference between the cash price of a commodity and its Board of Trade futures price, farmers can lock in prices and join speculators making money as markets rise and fall. What if we see an opportunity where basis weakens seasonally. Growing up on an Idaho family farm and cutting his teeth at a local grain elevator, Ruhoff later spent years in the Midwest commodity trade before returning home to impart bins full of knowledge. We were kind of trading a reversion back to the mean. Ruhoff's students get their feet wet with supply and demand analysis, form risk management strategies, and dive into real world experience. We'd like to sell that 5,000 bushels cash grain at 568 to you. Students in our case have a chance to actually trade the actual commodity and take on the futures position to hedge that. So from an agribusiness perspective, it's about margin management, sustainability of the family farm. So what we try to do is teach them the concept of if you own a bushel of wheat, what kind of risk do you encounter in the marketplace? So once they buy that bushel of wheat, they can actually sell that back to the cash market, do nothing, be exposed to market risk, or hedge it. And that's essentially selling it on the futures market. But understanding puts and calls is a process, even for students who grew up around agriculture. I remember my very first day in this class, and I remember the first question I asked, I raised my hand and said, Norm, you're teaching us how to gamble. Why don't we just go play blackjack? And I was looking at uh, candlesticks and uh, the way that prices were moving and how you could go long and make money if the prices went up or short, make money if the prices go down. Colt Stoll had zero knowledge of hedging practices before being immersed in Ruhoff's curriculum, just like Cole Likely, a fifth-generation cattle rancher from southern Idaho. Now one of a handful of students who graduated having earned a Series 3 license with the National Futures Association, a self-regulatory organization designed to safeguard the U.S. derivatives industry. It was a really big eye-opener and it just captured me from the beginning and ever since learning about it in Norm's very introductory class, I've, I've just put everything I can into it to try to understand the industry more so you can go back and help those ranchers manage their risk and stay sustainable. After graduation, Likely began work as a cattle broker in Nebraska before returning to Idaho in a similar position. Classmate Justin Chapman started his career trading grain in North Dakota. I'm tickled pink about, you know, the commodity markets and all the different moving parts of being a merchandiser and also being able to connect with farmers and, um, you know, just kind of learning about their traditions. Chapman and Bailey Storms both came to the Commodity Risk Management Program without a farming background, but found intense personal and professional value from their education. I'm going in to be a credit officer trainee, and I am going to need to have a knowledge base of markets in order to most effectively help those customers. So that was something that was really important for me. 
The agriculture industry is bullish about the things happening in Moscow, Idaho. The school's graduates are sought out nationwide to trade commodities around the globe. And Ruhoff says alumni are giving back by mentoring the next batch of undergrads. Last year, the Idaho Wheat Commission announced a $2 million endowment to help the University of Idaho expand its program by establishing a chair of risk management. Boy, did I get a lesson. <laughs> Commissioner Bill Flory, who graduated from the school decades before the risk management program came into being, runs a diverse operation in the northern part of the state. He's been impressed by the caliber being cultivated at his alma mater. Norm is just an outstanding prof. I mean, he's got the real world experience. He's really well grounded. He listens. He lets them run. You know, I mean, it's just classroom is very dynamic and that's very important. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah appreciate it. I think you're definitely on the right track. That's what this program does is interfaces very directly with industry and, and with producers and provides great utility as far as an understanding of the complexities of markets and hedging and risk management. Similar approaches are scarce across America's academic landscape, and university staff beam with pride over what they've helped build. I look back on my career, and this is an opportunity for me to really pay it forward. I'm a third generation grain merchandiser, followed my father and grandfather into a small country operation. And beyond that, out of a family of eight kids, six of us graduated from the university. So very proud to see what we're doing with our program and putting recognition out there for the University of Idaho. For Market to Market, I'm Josh Bittner. Next, the Market to Market report. The commodity markets dealt with reduced biofuel production, renewed Chinese buying, and rainy weather in South America. Added to it was the shortest bear market in history on Wall Street and optimism over the CARES Act. For the week, May wheat shot up 32 cents and the nearby corn contract gained 3 cents. The May soybean contract jumped 19 cents and May soybean meal lost $2.10 per ton. May cotton fell 235 per hundred weight. In the dairy parlor, April class three milk futures dropped 81 cents. The livestock sector was mixed. June cattle cut a dime, May feeders gained 268 and the June lean hog contract shed 370. In the currency markets, the U.S. dollar index gave back 480 ticks, a 4.7% loss. May crude oil fell $1.52 per barrel. Comex gold climbed or 165.10 per ounce, reversing last week's drop. And the Goldman Sachs commodity index spiked 55 points to finish at 268.40. Joining us now to offer insight on these and other trends is one of our regular market analysts, Dan Huber. Welcome, Dan. Thanks very much. It's great to uh, virtually be here with you. <laughs> virtually, you know, and some say that's just the best way. Absence makes the heart oh, well, go fonder. Yeah, it, 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 in this, it, this, uh, under the circumstances, probably the best way for now, at least. Yes. All right. Well, you know, this is the new norm, and it, and it appears that volatility is one of those crazy things that we're dealing with. Next week, we have the end of the month, the end of the quarter, and a USDA report. Mm -hmm. Let's just throw a few more things into volatility for next week. What do you say to that? Oh, sir. Oh, certainly. You know, this, you know, you might as well cram all you can in at once. And uh, you know, since we don't really have much we can do outside at this point, we might as well uh, we might as well enjoy all these type of activities that the government's supplying to us. So it. Uh, but you know, what well, again, these numbers next week are absolutely going to be important. I mean, particularly that prospective planning figure, but boy, there are just so many things in flux here at this point in time. I mean, not that the market won't take them seriously, uh, particularly, uh, you know, the grain stocks, of course, that's a little more hard, fast number, but, uh, but boy, you know, looking out into the springtime and uh, decisions on, gosh, what can we get out and do? I mean, the, this planning number is very much going to be in flux as we look forward here. I do have a couple of questions about acreage we'll get to in a moment. We need to start with wheat. That was one of the big winners up the nearby contract, 32 cents. That's a 6% gain. Uh, however, we're pushing higher highs, but the, the question is, and we're challenging resistance, but are we overbought now? 
Oh, absolutely. You know, we pushed up against some highs we had witnessed maybe back around October of last year. Uh, some of the shorter term indicators are, are definitely into the overbought situation. So now, granted, not that we couldn't accelerate through, but I think to do so, we're going to need to have a little more concrete, positive news to make that happen. So, but, you know, around the world, you know, with all the uncertainty that's out there, availability of supplies, and of course, we do know that um, you know people in certain nations are are stockpiling. You know, e even domestically here, we have a lot of people who have uh, have been stockpiling on wheat, even though many probably haven't made uh, products from scratch for uh, 20 or 30 years. But you know, we've got that in hand here at this point. So it's uh, you know they, there, there's a two-edged sword there, of course, too. That uh, you know, if we bought all this product ahead, and we know millers uh, domestically and throughout the world are kind of scratching to get inventory at this point in time, which you know certainly helped to lift those wheat prices up. But you know, we have the counter effect there too. That uh, you know, at some point, once once we are through this crisis. There's going to be a lot of, of, of uh, not the raw product per se, but of course finished products that people might have on their shelves, and we could see demand fall off a cliff here at that point. So is wheat going to, I mean, we know corn is facing a whole lot of stories. We'll get to that in a minute. But is wheat got any sure, more room sure. to go back up? Or are you making a sale right well, now? You know, I, I personally, I think you make a sale right now. You know, in fact, I had uh, written in my commentary this morning. We probably want to get into the first of the week just to see how we react, get get through these reports here. But but yes, I I think it's probably a good time for a new crop, old crop, either one to uh, to go ahead and start making some sales. I mean, old crop if you if you theoretically have it yet, but uh, but start making some sales maybe because these are as good a numbers as we've looked at here in the last year, and I think it's time to uh, to reward that. Now, certainly, we know acreage is not big in this country, but like I said, when you look at it on a worldwide basis, the, uh, Inter the International Grains Council up their world production numbers uh, again in their report here this morning. So, uh, boy, there's not a not a critical shortage around the globe. So uh, take advantage of good prices when you see them. I don't know. Are you a Rocky Balboa fan? Uh, you know, I I don't know if I'd call myself a fan. Okay. I, you know, but you're familiar enough Rocky with him. Movies. Oh, yeah, sure, you're familiar sure, with sure. Rocky Balboa. Do you think the corn market kind of looks like Rocky right now. It's pretty beat up. I mean, it has been withstanding a whole bunch of ethanol problems. Uh, we're going to have a whole bunch of it still sitting in the bins. We're going to plant a whole bunch of it, but yet we somehow squeaked out a win this week. Well, the, uh, you know, and of course, we have to consider that we have driven, you know, and it's not just the corn, but I mean, of course, so many commodity markets, uh, you know, livestock included, down to really recession lows. I mean, 2008, 2009 type of uh, valuations here. And, and, I, and I think that we held, that we bounced back a little bit on corn is indicative that, yes, there is still value out there. We, we still have a fair amount of livestock on feed. I mean, those numbers have not shrunken by any stretch of the imagination at this point. And I think there is some optimism that, Yes, you know, with China starting to come back into the world, you know, here they came in and bought corn this week, which, which, uh, you know, I, I think that was a, a little bit of a surprise that was up on their plate right away. But you know, really, for the last several weeks, the corn export sales have been have been improving pretty substantial, over 1.8 million metric tons this past week. So I think that is, uh, you know, showing us a little bit of light at the end of the tunnel. But boy, the big caveat there is you hit it already is the ethanol industry and and the uh, you, you know, and of course. Boy, you know, that wasn't just a one, two punch. That was a one, two, three, four punch. I mean, from the slowdown in the world economy, from trade wars to uh, you, the, the Saudis and Russia getting into a, a price war to see who can out uh, punish the other on uh, production numbers. And of course, now this with the slowdown in traffic, not just domestically, but worldwide because of this uh, this coronavirus, it's, it's pretty devastating. So yeah, yeah, there was a, re a report issued by uh, uh, University of Illinois today, Scott Irwin, you know, looking at what would happen if this really continued on. And they said, you know, worst case scenario, I mean, if we really didn't see improvements, see traffic starting ret returning to normal and business activity returning to normal, you could end up cutting demand, corn demand by up to 250 million plus which, uh, got, I mean, that's, you know, there, there's 10% of the uh, what's already projected yeah. carry out increase. So that's certainly not something we want to see for this ethanol or corn markets. All right, real quick on corn. Are you making any sales right now rewarding this rally? <laughs> I, I, yeah, I don't see any rush to sell corn at this point in time. You know, if you're, uh, if you have old crop, you know, unfortunately that that's that's a little tougher go, tougher game. Uh, but but I, I mean, I think we've got some room for improvement there too. You know, looking at the new 
crop. I mean, you've got a crop at your ice up at 388. Uh, you know, granted, that's not 80 percent of your production or 80 or 85 percent of your production. But I, but I think it's a good safety net. You know, why why need to start selling corn 20 cents lower than that uh, when we have all of the risk of the planting growing season in front of us? Uh, you know, just if we looked at prices a year ago at this time, you know, maybe after this week a little bit less, but okay. we're not that much different than we were a year ago at this time. And you know, at that point, nobody could predict what was going to happen oh. for the spring last year. So if, if, too much uncertainty ahead. If they could, they'd be a whole other level of things. Let's move to beans, uh, Dan. Oh, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. Meal. Yeah. Uh, meal was ex extremely hot. That drove a lot of the market. Sure. Then Thursday, we had a sell-off. Went over to oil. What's uh, what's going to drive this market moving forward? Well, you know, of course, and the oil had, of course, been devastated here again. It went down to lows we hadn't seen since 2008, 2009. Finally saw a little recuperation uh, on the realization that a lot of these plants in Malaysia and those areas have now been, you know, the plantations have been virtually shut down because of the spread of the coronavirus there. But Neil, boy, I think you can look at one thing, and that's point your finger over to China. And uh, China, you, you, not that they don't have some health issues they're going to have to work through uh, in the days and weeks ahead, but you know they are trying to gear back up their livestock production. They're trying to get their economy rolling again. And between this issue, some delays in the South American harvest on soybeans, they're just not seeing the product come into the country at this point. The, the, the raw product, of course, soybeans come into the country, and you know, the meal prices just skyrocketed in China here this week. And I think that bled over to you know two weeks ago. We look at the meal market, and boy, it was the dog. And uh, here we are now, it's the, uh, the leader of the pack that's taking the soybeans higher. And, and you know, when you look at the soybeans, and, and, and you know, we've been overshadowed by all of this other news and, and uh, you know, where, where's China in this whole picture? I mean, it, it, it just seems like it was never going to come. But I think overlooked in that is, you know, look what the USDA has already done on carryout on soybeans. I mean, we're, we're less than half of what we were a year ago. Uh, we have some uncertainty on the acreage numbers. We'll find out some more on that, of course, next week. But boy, it would not take a, a big problem in the growing season, uh, one or two bushels the acre, and we're back down to some very tight, critical uh, uh, carryout numbers in soybeans. This in spite of another, what potentially is going to be another record crop out of South America. So, you know, the uh, the beans could be the one bright bright spot we have looking out into the uh, spring summer. This okay. Year. All right, I have to move along. I'm going to save a dollar question later. The, the livestock okay. market, okay. Uh, when we come into cattle, well, first, uh, before I get to cattle, I need to talk about uh, dairy prices. We are falling quickly here. What's going on? You know, it's a tough question, a good question. I mean, it's uh, you, you would think that, uh, you know, as uh, people are out uh, rushing in, uh, stocking up on uh, on uh, wheat products or some, you know, flours and pastas and canned goods and this type of thing. They would have done the same in dairy, but you know, I think we have to come back to the recognition as well that you know, dairy does not have the shelf life per se as uh, some of these other staples do in the uh, the grocery okay. store. And you know, it could, it could be the point. You know, they got to that they got to that toilet paper aisle and it was uh, it was dry and they were upset and they just left the forgot the milk. The point. Yeah, so, don't cry over spilled no, milk. Right. All right, I got to move into cattle that's quickly. Is right. uh, okay. is that one overbought? Uh, as well, or just run out of steam? Uh, you know, I, I think that with the, the crushing push today, cattle and hogs both, you know, it again was just a, a psychological battle. You know, I think the, the the realization that, you know, we may have a difficult time getting the summer barbecue season moving, uh, you know, and I, I think just punished all of those livestock markets here this last week. I mean, it really did look like we were starting to uh, to get into recuperation, and I think that just took the wind out of the, you know, or any momentum we had going at that point just kind of destroyed it. And, uh, you know, we, we I don't think we have tremendous downside potential. I mean, again, as I, I had mentioned before, if you look back here, we're down at, you know, what the what has been basis of support for the last two to three years, let alone going back all the way to the kind of the recession lows in 2008, 2009. But boy, we're going to have to see some good news on the economy, I think, before we start to turn these meat markets around again. Okay. Uh, speaking of turnaround, uh, there's not much of one in the hog market. That thing is looks like it's an EKG again today, just brutal Absolutely. on Friday. What's happening there? Is that tied to grilling <laughs> like with beef? 
Oh, I think I think you have the same impact there. I mean, if, if we would have been looking at the hog market uh, early this week, you know, it, it looked like a whole different beast. Uh, we were kind of finding some value in there, and I think some people were feeling a little bit better. But I think, you know, as the news uh, continues to kind of chip away at us, and you know. Back going to be necessarily two more weeks i mean i mean forget about the uh, the easter uh, the easter hams here at this point uh you know it just uh, it's it just hurting us on the demand and, and of course then if we start you know 3.3 million unemployment claims this week uh yeah and granted yeah there's going to be some money coming from the government which should help out and maybe some longer unemployment benefits but i think everybody is probably looking at how they're going to uh, start cutting back on expenses and uh, you know some of those places are going to come to the more expensive. Now, not that pork is an expensive yeah. cut of meat. I mean, but one enough. country is going to be favored. And uh, you know, I think I think that it just until we can uh, start seeing some light at the okay. end of the tunnel for this. They're spending their money on their data, and I'm out of it right now with you. Thank you, Dan Huber. All right, that wraps up the broadcast portion of Market to Market, but we will keep this conversation going on Market Plus, where we'll answer more of your questions. You can find it on our website at markettomarket.org. This week, check out the M2M podcast where you can hear how we've been producing this program in these different times. And we also remember Dean Borg. Mr. Borg was the longtime host of Iowa Press here at Iowa PBS and the occasional fill-in host for Market to Market. He passed away from pancreatic cancer on Monday. Join us again next week when we'll assemble a panel of analysts to break down the numbers in next week's USDA report. So until then, thanks for watching. Have a great week. Market to Market is a production of Iowa PBS, which is solely responsible for its content. Pioneer Hybrid International is a proud sponsor of Market to Market. Tomorrow, for over 100 years, we've worked to help our customers be ready for tomorrow. Trust in tomorrow. Information is available from a Grinnell Mutual agent today. AccuSteel, offering fabric covered buildings specifically designed for the cattle industry since 2001. The next generation of cattle buildings. Information at AccuSteel.com.